Hey guys, in this video I want to practice mechanistic reasoning and drawing a plausible reaction mechanism for an organic reaction. And this particular reaction we're going to look at comes from Learning Target Quiz 1.1 in the Spring 2024 semester. Before we dive in and start drawing curved arrows and reactive intermediates, the first thing I want to do is just get a broad sense of the bonds made and broken in the reaction and the nature of the reaction conditions are we looking at. Basic conditions, acidic conditions, neutral conditions. What type of reaction conditions we're dealing with actually constrains the types of plausible reactive intermediates we can draw since we can't invoke very reactive cations, highly acidic cations under basic conditions, and we can't invoke strongly basic anions under acidic conditions. That's going to constrain what's plausible here. First though, let's number the atoms in the reactants and products to get a sense of the bonds broken and the bonds made. So on the left hand side we have the reactants and we have a carbonyl that's part of an ester group here and we see that ester group in the products and so this looks like carbonyl 1 and this uh, carbonyl oxygen 1 and carbonyl carbon 2 there. Carbon 3 is most likely still connected to carbon 2 and so there's carbon 3. We see the phenyl ring in the products right here and that's connected to carbon 5 in the reactant and there's no compelling reason to believe that phenyl ring moved around the molecule substantially so that's likely carbon 5 and carbon 5 is connected to oxygen 6 right there. The only atom we haven't accounted for is chlorine and there's only one chlorine in the reaction and that's got to be chlorine 4 right there. So now we can get a sense of the bonds made and broken now that we sort of mapped the reactant atoms onto the product atoms. For example, we can notice that the carbon-3 chlorine bond is broken here and no bond is made to the chlorine. Um, it just breaks off, right? We can also notice that there are implied hydrogens at carbon-3 here and here and one of those is retained in the product. There's a hydrogen here, but one of them is missing. So one of the bonds broken is C3H. We should also notice that the bond between carbon-5 and oxygen-6 goes from a double to a single, and so the pi bond between C5 and O6 is also broken, and this looks to be the last of the bonds broken. Yes. In terms of bonds made, well, one thing we should notice, and this actually wasn't in the original quiz, but this is an important byproduct, is that methoxide appears to have picked up a proton, H+. Plus. H++ plus plus OME minus gives HOME, and that HO bond is one of the important bonds made here. We can also notice that there are a couple of new bonds at carbon-3. There's a bond between carbon-3 and carbon-5. That's new. Those carbons are not connected in the starting material, so let's go ahead and list that. C3, C5. And then there's a new bond between C3 and O6 that's made. And this is, I believe, the last of the bonds made. Yes! So, one thing I want to point out before we move ahead here. C3Cl, that bond is broken and the electrons appear to go to the chlorine since the chlorine goes from neutral in the starting material to negatively charged in the product and so the, this bond is breaking toward the chlorine most likely. At the same time, a bond is made between C3 and O6 and C3 and C5 as well. And so it's likely here that oxygen was a nucleophile and donated electrons to C3 as the C3 chlorine bond broke. And again, changes in formal charge suggest this, right? This oxygen, being a heteroatom, is likely to be a nucleophile. And the chlorine went from neutral to negative, and the chlorine is likely to accept electrons like this. So we're already getting a sense of likely electron flows just from our list of bonds made and broken here. It's also worth noticing that one bond to an H is broken and one bond to an H is made. And this suggests that proton transfer is going to be involved in the mechanism. Specifically, the transfer of a proton from C3 to methoxide to create methanol and the conjugate base of this. 
In the actual problem, the elementary steps were given, and the first step given was proton transfer. And so just by listing the bonds made and broken, we've identified the most likely proton transfer here. But before we draw that, I did want to talk a little bit about what happened uh, with the most common mistake that was made as I was grading this LTQ, which involved deprotonating the aldehyde hydrogen, which is right here. So this is an aldehyde functional group, carbonyl group connected to H and some other carbon group, and a number of people deprotonated at this hydrogen. There's some good about that. The good thing is most of those people noticed that this is a basic atom. And in fact, methoxide is the best base in this reaction mixture. And so looking for a proton transfer, we're looking for a base and an acid. And the best base is unquestionably methoxide. And we're dealing with basic conditions. So all of our reactive intermediates should be neutral or negatively charged, no cations in this reaction mixture. From there, we need to find the most acidic position. And a number of people deprotonated at the aldehyde, primarily just because that H was drawn out explicitly. And we really, that, that's really just a surface feature, right? We don't want to deprotonate just because an H is drawn out explicitly. And there are other good reasons not to deprotonate here that we'll talk about in a second. And so this is going to lead, whoop, this is going to lead via a proton transfer to an anion that looks like this. That carbon we deprotonated is now negatively charged, and it lacks any more hydrogens. Now, a number of people also noticed, hey, I can draw a resonance structure for this by pushing the CO pi electrons up to oxygen, which is completely fine, right? Nothing wrong with that electron flow at all. Oop. However, notice, now this carbon is neutral, since we took electrons away from it. And notice also that it only has six total electrons, two, four, six, two bonds, and a lone pair. So this carbon is violating the octet rule, and that's not great. This is actually not a great resonance form for this anion. And it shows that the anion itself is not super stable. So this was not the best deprotonation. And of course, as sort of the ultimate fallback, the ultimate evidence that this is an implausible deprotonation, if you look at the pKa of this hydrogen, it is way, way too high to be deprotonated by methoxide. This is a much, much weaker acid than methanol. Methanol is actually a stronger acid than the aldehyde. And so this is an implausible deprotonation. Other evidence that this is not the direction we want to go. If we look at carbon-5 in the products, notice that at carbon-5, we still have a hydrogen. And the hydrogen that's linked to carbon-5, well, that is the aldehyde hydrogen in the starting material. So that hydrogen is actually retained throughout the mechanism. That hydrogen did not appear in our list of bonds made and broken above. No mention of C5H in these bonds made and broken. And so invoking that bond in the mechanism is probably not reasonable. And what often ended up happening for people who eventually found their way to this product is they put that proton right back where they got it from because that need, needed to happen later on in the mechanism. So long story short, this is not a plausible mechanistic path to go down. It's the implausibility of that proton transfer um, from the aldehyde to methoxide that really makes this the case. So what can we do instead? Well, again, we can go back to our list of bonds made and broken and say, okay, I need to remove a proton from carbon three. And I've got two of those at carbon three, and I could remove either one of them. It doesn't really matter. And that's going to produce a carbanion at carbon three. And this is indeed a proton transfer step. So we have the ester group adjacent to that ester group. Now we have a carbanion that looks like this. One thing we can notice about this carbanion is it's actually resonance stabilized. We can, for example, push this lone pair into a pi bond and push electrons up to oxygen like this to generate an alternative resonance form of this thing. And this is good evidence that this is 
if not a favorable deprotonation, whoop, at least one that goes to a small extent. This anion also benefits from the chlorine. Chlorine is electronegative, inductively withdrawing. It's going to stabilize negative charge that it's pretty close to, like so, through an inductive effect. And so this is a plausible anion to invoke in the reaction mixture, I would say. And we're well on our way to the product since via our list of bonds made and broken, we've broken one of the key bonds. And we've actually made one of the key bonds in, in methanol, right? It's worth noticing that the byproduct of this step is methanol, and that's one of the products of the reaction. And so we're well on our way, and we've accomplished this first proton transfer step that's listed in the mechanistic steps. All right, where do we go from here? Well, now we're on to the second step, which is nucleophilic addition to a polarized pi bond. So the general idea here is we're going to add a nucleophile, typically in the form of a lone pair at an anionic atom in particular, specifically this lone pair right here is jumping out at me as a nucleophile. We're going to add that to a polarized pi bond, a pi bond between two atoms of different electronegativity. And now we need to keep in mind that the aldehyde is still there in the reaction mixture. We haven't invoked this in the mechanism just yet. And this is a classic polarized pi bond, right, with a dipole moment pointing up toward the carbonyl oxygen and partial positive charge the carbonyl carbon. So I've got a great electrophile, the carbonyl carbon, great nucleophile at that anionic carbon that we just generated by deprotonating in the first step. And this is going to establish one of the bonds we need, right? This is going to establish a bond between carbon-3 and carbon-5, and that's exactly what we need. So here now, we're going to add the nucleophile and push the electrons in the polarized pi bond up to the more electronegative atom. This is general electron flow for pretty much any nucleophilic addition type of step. So here's our ADN step. And with only one polarized pi bond really around in the reactants, this is kind of the only plausible ADN step to do at this point. All right, to save myself a little bit of time, I'm going to abbreviate that ester group as CO2ME. And the chlorine is still there. We've made a bond between carbon-3 and carbon-5. Negative charge at this oxygen now. And the H and phenyl are still connected to carbon-5. And so just to review our numbering a little bit here, we have carbonyl-1, carbonyl carbon-2, carbon-3, and the chlorine is still there. And we made the bond to carbon-5 and oxygen-6 is right here. Now to finish off the mechanism, the third step here is bimolecular nucleophilic substitution. So we know that's what's going to take place between this reactive intermediate and the final product. The question is, what's my nucleophile, what's my electrophile, and what does the electron flow look like? Here again, we can use our list of bonds made and broken to guide our thinking here. We've got to break one more bond, the carbon-chlorine bond, and we've got to make one more bond, the bond between oxygen-6 and carbon-3. And notice, I've got negative charge on oxygen-6 right here. Got a lone pair on there that we can use as a nucleophile. And the chlorine is a good leaving group. And so I have an electrophile at carbon-3 and a good leaving group in the chlorine. And we can put these observations together to draw an S and 2 step that essentially finishes off the mechanism with oxygen-6 donating a pair of electrons to carbon-3 and the carbon-leaving group bond breaking toward the leaving group, which in this case is chlorine. Notice that this generates our other byproduct, the chloride anion, and this closes the epoxide ring by forming the bond between carbon-3 and oxygen-6. And we have finished off the mechanism. So a couple of things to note as we review here. A lot of people deprotonated at the aldehyde. I think just because the aldehyde hydrogen was drawn out explicitly, but that doesn't mean that we should automatically invoke it in the electron flow. Don't forget to think about implied hydrogens, and don't forget about those basic mechanistic strategies, 
mapping the atoms, bonds made and broken, these go a long way actually toward helping you figure out and notice patterns in electron flow and recognizing where certain types of elementary steps are going to take place. For example, noticing that this bond is made and this bond is broken points to an SN2 type of elementary step. Noticing a bond made between carbon-3 and carbon-5 suggests nucleophilic addition to carbon-5, which is a good electrophile. And finally, recognizing that this CH bond broke while an OH bond was made suggests proton transfer. So particularly when you're given the elementary steps like this, those kinds of basic observations about where electrons go, where atoms go, can help you really get started, get the ball rolling on the mechanism. Another important thing I would point out is that all of our reactive intermediates here are negatively charged. And this is typical of basic conditions which we could infer from the reagent used. The reagent is a decently strong base in, in methoxide. You want to avoid acidic cationic intermediates. Those are implausible under these reaction conditions since based on fundamental ideas about acid-base equilibrium that you know from chemical principles too, it's not going to be reasonable to propose a strongly acidic molecule in a strongly basic reaction mixture.